Today we're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 and 43. You know, I, I love Communion Sunday with our church family. You know, it's such a humbling time for us to gather together and to uh, look at the communion table and to be reminded of the elements of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Well, before we get into our text this morning, I, I want to say a couple of things to you, a couple of things that I want to remind you of this time of year. First of all, I want to say to you, don't take this for granted. Don't take this for granted. The gathering together that we have every weekend of the church. You know, many things will try and pull you away from this time we have together on Sunday mornings. I know that many of you might say, well, Sunday is my only day to sleep in. Sunday is my only day to rest. Sunday is my only day that I don't have to work. You know, the excuses are, are plentiful. But I pray that 2019 for you will be a year of priorities where you will make church a priority in your life. Don't take for granted the time of communion that we have. I know that for many of us in this room, we've been Christians for a long time. You know, for me, I, I grew up in church, and I've taken communion countless, countless times. And it's easy for me to just find myself going through the motions of saying, yeah, there's the bread, and there's the grape, and yes, this represents Jesus' broken body for me. But this morning, I want to remind you to not go through the motions, to be thankful and be grateful for all that God has done for us. I want to take you into the book of Acts today. The book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, is an account of the establishment of the church. Basically, the book of Acts is like the bridge between Jesus' life and the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the establishment of the church and the rapid growth of the early church. Today, I want to take you to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 43. What we're going to be focusing in this morning is the fellowship of the believers and seeing how the early church did church, of how they functioned and the things that were the top priority to them. I want to read this to you today, and I want you to, before I even get into the notes, I want you to see if anything jumps out at you of the characteristics of the early church and the things that they held to the highest standard and were the most important to them. Without further ado, let's read our scripture for today. Starting with verse 42, it says this, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I want to invite you into a time of, of teaching today. I want to invite you into a time of, of looking at this scripture and looking at the things that the early church held as the top priority, of understanding what was a priority for the early church and what do we need to make a priority and have the characteristics of our church today. What are some of the non-negotiable things that have to be happening in any church and I want to take you through and I want to walk you through the four things this morning that the, the scripture in Acts tells us about. The first thing today I want to talk to you about is, is sound doctrine, sound doctrine. Now, when I say that, you may be thinking, it sounds like I'm sitting in a seminary class, or it sounds like I'm sitting in a college class. What in the world are you talking about sound doctrine? Well, the term church is actually, actually very flexible in our society today. In fact, if one of you wanted to go and start a church, all you would really need to do is go file for your nonprofit, get you a tax ID number, finds you a place to meet, and you can slap a sign down by the road, create a Facebook page, have a YouTube channel, and you can call yourself a church. But what I mean by that is there is little accountability in our culture today for calling yourself a church. We are overwhelmed in 2018 by being able to watch anything, anytime, anywhere. And that's a, that's a good thing. That can be a, a blessing. It's very nice to have technology and to be able to listen to sermons and to be able to, to research things online. But I want to tell you, there's also a lot of potential danger in that. And that's why I'm saying that the church that's functioning right is focused, laser focused in upon sound doctrine. Well, the question becomes, what is sound doctrine? That's quite a broad question based upon how much information is in our world today and how it's accessible to us anytime, anywhere. Well, if we go back to our scripture this morning, in the text, it clearly tells us that the church, the early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching or the apostles' doctrine. Now, the apostle Peter was one of the key people in the teaching and the preaching in the early church and the doctrine in the book of Acts. Sound doctrine simply means this, 
that the Bible, that God's holy, infallible, inspired word is the only thing that is being taught. Now, I know that that sounds so elementary. And some of you might say, well, duh, Pastor Luke, I, I know that. I know that that's what sound doctrine means. But let me, let me warn you. Let me warn you that Satan is sneaky. That Satan is going to try his best to get you away from sound doctrine. See, Satan can easily take a full truth, water it down into a half truth, and disguise it as a full truth through a false teacher. Church, I see it every single day of my life. A half truth being disguised as a full truth. Church, when you desire absolute truth in your life, truth has already been spoken to us by the word of God. See, false teachers will try and take a little bit away or add a little bit to some of the scripture. And if you don't know the word of God, if you don't have sound doctrine in your life, if you've not devoted your time and your efforts to the teaching and the studying of the word of God, you will be fooled. You will be in danger of falling for false doctrine. It's that conviction that you have in your heart. When a pastor says something and it just doesn't sit well with you. It's that Christian author who writes a book and your gut tells you that something isn't right with what they've said. Listen to the the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Test what you hear up against the Word of God. We are so blind sometimes. We are like sheep. We follow whatever's popular, whatever sounds good, or whatever looks good. All forgetting that Absolute truth comes from the Word of God. See, church, just because something sounds good, just because something is even labeled Christian, doesn't always mean that it is. Other religions, for example, if you've ever researched other religions, they have things that sound really nice and things that will appeal to your thoughts. But in context of what is truth and what is false, what is true good doctrine and what is false doctrine, The scriptures are all that we need. Well, as we take a look at the early church, that is what they devoted their time to, was the teaching of sound doctrine. That is why the world was being flipped upside down by the gospel. That is why you read in the book of Acts that thousands upon thousands and thousands of people were repenting of their sins and turning to Jesus. It wasn't the personality of a pastor. It wasn't the the, the amount of ministries that the church had. It wasn't a worship style. It wasn't a denomination. It was being rooted in sound doctrine. The teaching and the preaching of the absolute truth of the holy, infallible, inspired word of God. That is why the church was growing. That is why the church is growing here in the book of Acts. And here at City Soul. That's the type of church we want to be. Our reputation, we want to be a church that is devoted to sound doctrine, to the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. The next thing that we see here as a characteristic and definitely a priority in the early church, and I want to say it to you in our number two today, is the word fellowship. Number two today is fellowship. If you have like your top five churchy words, your church and ease, fellowship is definitely in the top five. We have the fellowship hall at the church. We have our fellowship time. Stand up and greet your neighbor. Fellowship with your neighbor. It's such a churchy term. But it's better known as sharing together. Being together. Coming together for the same cause. Different races. Different social backgrounds. Different ages. All coming together for one purpose. And that's for the gospel. Fellowship and family go hand in hand. And many of you here today know exactly what I'm talking about. Your church family is exactly what it says it is. It's more than just gathering together on Sunday mornings. It's more than just coming to an event on Sunday mornings. These people in your church quickly become your family. They understand what I'm talking about today, church family. Now, I understand that in a church of our size, at times, you can't get to know everybody. That you don't know everybody on a personal level. But many of you in this room today have connected with people in this church. And you don't just call them friends. You call them family. Church family and our time together is so important. You know, in the early church, 
I often wonder if we're missing the mark by not taking care of each other the way that they did in the early church. They took care of each other in amazing, amazing ways. If there was a brother or sister in Christ that had a need, they would rally together to meet that need. As the pastor of this church, and if you were to ask me the question, how are we doing as a church when it comes to caring for those inside of the church? I would say that we're doing an excellent job. Not that we can meet every need, every single time, every single place, but I have never, I have grown up in church my whole life. My dad has pastored churches all over the United States. I have been in so many churches and I have never never seen a group of people that is more giving and more loving and more grateful than this group of people at this church. And of course, I'm supposed to say that. That's my job, right? But can you sense my sincerity? I believe it. I believe that this church is full of people who are so loving, so giving, and so modeled to the early church. Rarely do I hear people say, I'm just having a hard time connecting at City Soul. I'm having a hard time having fellowship. But maybe today you are that person. And I want to kindly say to you, what can you do to get more involved? Where can you put yourself out there a little more? Volunteer for a ministry. Volunteer for our breakfast ministry. Get involved in a small group. Do your best to get connected and get to know somebody. Get involved. So the first two characteristics of the church are, number one, sound doctrine. Number two is fellowship. And then number three is something we're going to get to do together today. And that's the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a very special time in any church. And my conviction as a pastor is, is I believe that the Lord's Supper is is best observed whenever we are together as the church, as the body of Christ. Well, here in the book of Acts, and we've read today, this is the third thing that the church did together. Not only did they eat together and fellowship together and taught the word of God together, they broke bread together or what we're saying today, the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a very special time of reminding us of what Jesus has done for us. The bread represents his broken body for us. The grape represents his shed blood upon the cross. A city soul, we have the bread and the grape that reminds us of Jesus. It brings us together and reminds us why we gather. It keeps our focus upon Jesus. Breaking bread together is a time that is so important. It's a time that is so incredibly precious as the church. And as I told you earlier, we don't ever want to take it for granted. We don't ever just want to go through the motions and say, well, it's communion Sunday. Here we go. We have devoted at our church every Sunday, every month that has five Sundays in it. As we combined our two services and we come together as one corporate body of Christ and we take communion together. Now, we also have communion different times throughout the year, special services, Easter time, Good Friday, um, or whenever the Lord lays it upon my heart. But we have that schedule here at this church. Communion today is open to all believers. It's all people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, those who have repented of their sins, trusted Jesus as king of their lives. Communion is open to all people this morning. Doesn't matter if you're in from out of town and you're a member of another church. Doesn't matter who you are today. If you are a believer Have your faith in Jesus Christ. Communion is open to you. Lastly today, in a church that is functioning correctly, just like the early church, not only is sound doctrine important, not only is fellowship important, and not only is the Lord's Supper very important, I must highlight the fourth characteristic to you today. And I believe that for many of us, this is one that we struggle with the most. Number four today is prayer. Number four is prayer. Of all the characteristics we've talked about, I've noticed that prayer is so intimidating to so many Christians. You know, I remember when I started in the ministry at the age of, age of 19, I was terrified. I was terrified to get in front of people. I was terrified to, to open up the Word of God and, and preach it to people. But then I was like, oh my goodness, I have to pray in front of people? That was just like almost the icing on the cake where I was like, you know what? I don't think this ministry thing is, is for me. And I remember the Lord just gave me this peace. He said, Luke... Don't be ashamed of praying in front of people. Don't be ashamed. And not that I was ashamed. I was just scared. I was intimidated. In a church that is functioning the way it should be, we should be people of prayer. I know that many of you this morning would roll over in your seat and just kill over. 
if I said, I'm going to randomly select somebody to close the service in prayer this morning. This place would uh, uh, file out real quickly. You guys would be uh, scrambling for the door because many of us are intimidated by prayer. But let me ask you a very serious question. When was the last time that you prayed for this church? Think about that for a second. When was the last time that I spent prayer for my church here at City Soul Ministries? When was the last time you sat quietly with no distractions, no phone, no TV, nobody else around, and you quieted your heart before the Lord, and you poured your heart out to Him? I can't survive without my quiet time and my prayer time. I love coming into this space right here where you're sitting this morning throughout the week when there's nobody here and it's dead quiet in here, And I always just pick a random chair and I'll sit down. I'll leave my phone in the sound booth or back in the office and I'll quiet my heart before the Lord. And I'll just have this moment of of just quieting my heart and, and listening for the still voice of God in my life. For those of you in the room today that struggle with prayer, and I would say that many of you do, we are devoting the beginning of 2019 to become a a better people of prayer here at City Soul Ministries. Well, you may ask, well, how's that going to happen? By having a laser-focused study in the Bible on prayer. I'm going to take you through some of the Psalms in the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is going to take us into a deeper relationship with our Heavenly Father. No more superficial, just going through the motions of our prayer life. We're going to be learning that there are different seasons of our lives. There's going to be seasons of despair. There's going to be seasons of struggle. There's going to be seasons of tragedy. And there's, then there's going to be seasons of good and uh, good things happening in our lives. But all the while learning how to pray and how to be real in our prayers, no matter what's going on in our lives. I believe this morning that if you will commit with us to being a part of this study, to coming in on Sunday mornings, to focus in on prayer with us, that the Lord is going to rock your world through this study, that he is going to open your eyes to many of the Psalms and the prayers that King David prayed and sang in the book of Psalms, and how I'm going to be very real and very raw with you. I'm going to share some very personal stories in my life of how I've struggled with prayer and how God has opened my eyes to the reality of prayer and and how my prayers need to be sincere. You know, as we prepare our hearts for communion here shortly, the characteristics of any church should be boiled down to the four things that we've talked about today. Number one is sound doctrine. Whatever you hear, whatever you're hearing preached, whatever you're reading, whatever is in your face that is called Christian, test it against the word of God. I don't expect you to come in here and be a blind sheep and follow me. Follow the word of God. Test what I say up against the word of God. Just because I say something good or a pastor says something good, don't take it as absolute truth. Test it against the word of God. There are plenty of churches in our culture today where scripture is an afterthought, where the church's reputation is built upon a culture or whatever, a pastor's personality. And it's almost like, is Jesus even a part of this church? Is Jesus even a, a thought? Is he even the, 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 the number one thing in this church? A place where sound doctrine is being taught. is so important. Then it's fellowship. Get involved. Stop sitting there on Sunday morning and just being a breathing chair. Get involved. Find a place to get involved. And the best way for that to be happening inside of the context of a church like this and a church of this size is to get involved in a small group. Find a place to get plugged in. That marriage group that's happening, um, that's going to be incredible. I'm telling you right now, you do not want to miss that class. Sign up today. That is an incredible opportunity for you to meet other couples in this church to get connected. And even today, if you're just dating or you're single, come to that class. It's going to speak amazing truth into your life. Fellowship communion, the breaking of bread together as the body of Christ, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then finally, it's prayer. Being a people of prayer, being a church of prayer, lifting not only this church up in prayer, but lifting each other up in prayer, being there for one another in the struggles, praying for one another in the good days, the bad days, and everything in between. I want 2000 to be, 2019 to be a year where we focus upon these four characteristics. As our last Sunday to gather together in 2018, may we end on the right foot.
And then we go into 2019 with this attitude of, we want to be like the early church. We don't want to be like anything else. We don't want to be what's popular in our culture. We want to be relevant to the culture, of course. But we cannot. We cannot stray away from the Word of God. And then understanding that your life throughout the week, there's a lot of different things that want to pull you away from the truth. That Satan has a very sneaky way of disguising false in our society today. Even the most seasoned Christians can be fooled at times by a, by a speaker or by a book or by a thought or by a philosophy. Understand that everything that is true in this world, everything that is trustworthy comes from the Word of God. Everything that I say, everything that a pastor says, test it up against the Word of God. Know that 2019, we're expecting God to continue to do a mighty work in this church. We don't plan on, stop, on slowing down or stopping anytime soon. And I will continue to be here preaching till I'm blue in the face, until the Lord either comes back for His church or my life is taken. I hope that 2019 is going to be a special time for this church.